Okay, so hello everyone. Um, welcome to this session. So what we're going to be talking about today is how to improve and get better as a speaker in particular. Now, a lot of this will apply to something like judging as well, um, but primarily the focus of this is improving as a speaker. So uh, some general things. Um, there are one or two resources I'm going to be talking about and using. Um, I will share my screen with you so you can see them. I will also publish links to all those things. So for example, this PowerPoint, I'll put a PDF in the, in the chat and share it on Discord, etc. afterwards. So don't feel compelled to take notes um, unless you think it is useful for you. You can ask questions whenever you want on just in the chat is probably easiest. I've got it open so I can see it on my other screen. And um, there'll also be a sort of dedicated question and answer session at the end. So I guess what makes most sense is if you have a question about something we're currently discussing, type it in chat. If it's completely unrelated, ask it at the end, make a note of it um, so you don't forget. So, um, I just want to start with a sort of general idea here. And you hear this a lot, and I hear this a lot from novices. They look at debaters who they think is very, very good, and they just think, look, I'm just never going to be good. I'm never going to be as good as Emma, for example. And the big thing to note here is that there is actually nothing super special about the vast majority of, of good debaters. All good debaters were pretty bad when they first started. No one was immediately amazing. Maybe some of this is hidden from us because, for example, um, some top speakers did lots of training as world school speakers, for example. So they come to university and they're already perceived as being very, very good. But really, they're just sort of the same as us, but sort of pushed a few years ahead of the process. Some of these people are smart, but honestly, from speaking to a lot of them, honestly, lots of them are really not that smart. Lots of them didn't have world schools training. And while barriers might exist based on who you are, where you come from, again, there are success stories from basically everywhere in the world, every different background. That doesn't mean it's not harder for certain people from certain backgrounds, but the point here is it's not impossible. And in any case, even if you're never gonna be good enough to win worlds, that doesn't mean you can't be satisfied and happy with what you did achieve. Very few people ever, like no one to my knowledge has ever won world's Euros, all the national titles and topped all of the tabs. No one ever does it. Almost always, whichever team breaks top loses at some point in the early out rounds, so on and so forth. Um, no one ever achieves absolutely everything. What you can do, however, is get better from where you are now to a point where you are happy and proud of what you have done. Everyone will also get better simply by doing debating more. You don't need a big sort of process to get better at debating. If all you want to do is just go and have fun, slowly get better over time, then simply going to debating competitions and trainings will probably be enough. The purpose of this though, and this session is the question of, well, what if I do say, I really, really, really want to break at Euros, for example. I have the time to put in and I'm willing to commit effort. How do I do that? If I want to take debating more seriously and speed up my improvement, how do I go about doing that? And um, by way of some background, um, I was also pretty terrible when I started. I got better. And I think an interesting thing about my background, um, I was at university for quite a long time because I did quite a long course. It was like six years. And so I came from a school that had very, like a bit of debating, but not seriously. I did like two competitions before, before university and I did terribly at them. And what I found was that for my first couple of years of university, I just really wasn't really getting that much better. And I did, in the end, I did six internationals and I sort of vaguely plotted them on this, on this graph in chronological order. So Vienna, uh, Euros, Warsaw Euros, Tallinn, Talon, oh, I've written Talon Worlds, that's obviously a lie, Talon Euros, um, and then Fest, Dutch Worlds, and Mexico Worlds, which might seem like a long time ago for you guys. But the only reason I wanted to stick this graph up is just to note, um, first of all, that for the first couple of years, I wasn't even on this graph because I wasn't even selected for the, the Euros team um, or the Worlds team. I, I went to judge, but I didn't really do anything very good there. Um, and I think you can also see 
for the first three, I actually managed to get slowly worse after Vienna. I mean, it's not the sort of uh, error and noise in nine rounds of debating means that this is probably relatively significant, insignificant. But the point here is that it took a while where I was just not really improving at all. And then I decided that if I was going to keep debating and I'd been doing debating long enough and I knew that I had sort of flashes of doing very well at the occasional competition, that if I stuck at it and sort of thought a bit more consciously about how to get better, I could. And that's sort of what I started doing. And I think then the, the last three data points on the graph sort of show that a bit more, that it was between sort of Vienna, uh, sorry, between Warsaw and Dutch worlds that I started to think, you know, actually, I do want to get better at this. I've invested so much of my time into this activity that going to another international and not breaking is just not what I want to do. So I took it a bit more seriously, continued to do so, improved over time. So what is the main thing we need to do? Um, and the main thing we need to be doing is deliberate practice. Now, this is from some psycho educational psychologist, I think, idea about the five principles of deliberate practice. We're not going to go into this in loads of detail, but the general idea here is that debating, like more or less any skill, is something that you should be practicing. Okay. And I think what people often don't do is think of it like that. They don't necessarily treat debating as seriously as they would anything else in life. If you, you know, all of you went to school, you did exams. What do you do before an exam? You do a practice exam. Uh, if you play a musical instrument, what do you do? You, you don't just play pieces, you practice scales, rudiments, whatever it might be. And people don't take debating seriously in terms of practice as much as would be useful for them. They also often, where they do have goals, are not measurable. I want to get better. What does that mean? Or are sort of unrealistic. I want to win worlds. Well, okay, that's a good end goal, but we need something more specific. And I also think that people don't take debating improving consciously. They don't think about it in a conscious way. They just go, I'll just keep doing tournaments. Maybe I'll do so I'll do some programs or something and that, that'll help me get better. But they don't approach it with a very deliberate the purpose of me doing this debate is to get better. Rather, people often approach each individual debate at a competition with the purpose of, I wish to win this debate. And then they lose the debate and they get annoyed and they don't really treat it as a means to an end. Debating becomes an end in itself with the sort of background hope of getting better. So what do we need to do and what sort of practically can we actually do to improve? So first thing, is we need to do some self-assessment and work out what our limiting factors are. I think debating progress is very rarely linear and there's clearly a whole basket of things you need to be competent at or good at in order to succeed in debating. So maybe there are certain motion types that you already feel very comfortable with and you feel like you're getting good results in those motions. Maybe certain positions you're like, look, closing, I'm very happy with, opening, I am not. Or maybe particular speaker positions. Maybe skills within debating, you feel like you're generally very good at rebuttal, but very poor at presenting new material, for example. Now, this is important to be self-reflective and critical here and to try and actually genuinely assess what you are good at. Now, it, saying that you are relatively good at something doesn't mean you believe you're amazing. I think what you need to work out here are what are the sort of limiting factors? Because if you are phenomenal at constructing arguments, but you can't rebut to save your life, then working more on some more extra fun, nuanced ways of constructing arguments probably isn't that useful for you. What I think you want to identify is what is the thing that I am currently worst at? How do I get better at that? Often people stay being bad at particular things because even if they know what they're bad at, they don't necessarily want to put in the work to fix it. Oh, I hate opening government. So every time there's a training debate, they always ask to be closing because they don't like being opening government. This is obviously, when you think about it for more than two seconds, a stupid idea because then you'll never get better at opening government. Um, likewise, people will be like, oh, I'm really bad at prep. I'm really bad at this topic. So I just hate those motions. No, if you're bad at something, you need to identify that you're bad at it. And then you need to take active steps to get better at it. And that involves confronting it directly. So how do you work out what you are bad at and good at? So one thing is data trends. We'll talk about this later. 
um, there are tools, some I will share with you, um, of things that you can do to work out and assess, like, am I good at particular positions? Am I good at particular motions or bad at particular motions? For myself, for example, statistically, I do way worse in opening government than any other position, um, even relative to something like closing government, which there is sort of a net debating trend to being a poor position for most people. You also might see trends like, for example, you are much stronger or weaker at deputy prime minister versus deputy leader of opposition. You can do this by collecting enough data, which you all have. Tabs produce huge amounts of data. You just need a way of collating it, sorting through it and analyzing it. And again, I'll give you some tools for that later. Next thing, feedback. Um, try and be specific in what you ask for feedback. We'll talk about this later. But if you keep getting told, um, I just thought your analysis wasn't good, which at face value is a very unhelpful in an individual sense. It doesn't tell you what you in that individual speech could have done better. But if you keep getting told that, even though it's kind of vague and unhelpful, it does tell you that there is a trend in this piece of advice, that that is something you clearly need to work on. And it doesn't matter whether the judge is good or bad who's giving you this piece of advice, it is someone who has noticed this. And if people keep telling you things, that is an issue. You can also ask specific questions. What was the one thing that was worst about my speech in this debate? And you can do this in training debates, you can do this in competitions, whatever. You can also just do simple self-reflection. Just honestly sit down to yourself and think, what am I bad at? And there are extra tools you can use here. Record your speech, listen to it back. Do you find yourself cringing at random things you said or ways you presented arguments? Do you, having now sat through the whole debate, listening back to your own speech think wow that like two minutes on the sort of veil of ignorance was entirely irrelevant and did not add anything to the debate i know that now from hindsight was there something i could have done when thinking forward so first thing you've got to do is and take this seriously as well i think you often people have ideas in their head like oh yeah i'm not great at this i'm not great at that but i think there are often things that might be hidden to you that you might not realize that's why asking for external advice it might be from current partners former partners people who judge you in debates listening to your own speeches will often make you think wow i did not know that this was an issue but clearly i have it you might also think you are very good at something but you might not be. So for example, a very common thing is people often think they are very good at debating about whatever their subject specialty is. So if you study economics, you might think, oh, I'm really, really good at doing economics debates. Often for a lot of people that isn't true because they fall into the inverse trap of having too much knowledge and therefore just being like, well, I don't need to rebut that because it's obviously stupid. I'll give like a two line sort of factual response to this thing. And then I'll start talking about this other thing, which to people who understand economics is the most important thing but for people who don't understand economics, i.e. the judging panel, they don't know why they care. Or you skip over things because you feel like they're so trivially obvious, you don't need to explain them. But the general point is, you might not know what it is that is your main weakness or your limiting factor. And therefore, you need to be self-aware and proactive in identifying what those things are. So... Once we've identified some things that we want to improve. Now, it doesn't have to just be one thing, of course, although it makes sense to prioritize. If you can work on a few different things simultaneously, because debating often gives you the option to do that. If I really want to improve my models, for example, well, probably um, I'm only gonna be opening Gov a quarter of the time. Maybe I'll have counter models in opening op, but you know, at least half of the debates I'm in, I can't really practice that so easily. So it would be useful for me to have a few different things to be working on simultaneously. How do we get better? Well, practice makes perfect. And like, this is just obvious, right? Ask anyone who is good at literally anything. Once you identify what you need to improve at, practice at it. And I think the other thing that people miss is that practice in every other sphere of life is not just doing the thing you're practicing for. Usain Bolt doesn't just run 100 meters repeatedly forever. He works in the gym. He might run shorter distance, longer distances, with weights, without weights, um, all these kinds of work. So isolate specific skills. Roger Federer doesn't just play tennis matches. He practices his serve. But also, once you've isolated those skills, construct or find different ways to practice them that aren't necessarily just in the debate. If I want to practice prep time, for example, 
well, across a whole day of debating, there will be, I don't know, four or five prep times I can do whether I, I can't really then evaluate that prep time because I've got to go straight into the debate. And then by the time I could then talk to my partner, be like, oh, what did you think of our prep time? Um, you know, an hour of debating has gone by. You have thought about lots of other things. You're chatting about the debate, etc. So isolate the specific skill or thing you need to practice and construct ways to work on it outside of the confines of just doing competitive debates in tournaments or in practice or whatever. So how do we do that? And I sort of split this up into a few different areas. The first area would be improving sort of skills. And I sort of arbitrarily have separated skills from content because there are often different things that people are good or bad at. So first thing you can do is uh, drills. There are some classic drills that everyone knows. So the most easy is giving PM speeches. Find a motion from a competition you went to or didn't go to, uh, prep for 15 minutes, give the prime minister's speech, record your speech, listen to your speech, think about what was good, what was bad. You can do the same with leader of ops speeches. You can also do these things against YouTube videos. You find a YouTube video of a good debate. There's loads of content, especially now because of online debating, it's become so much easier to record debates. There are so many excellent debates online. Um, HWS Round Robin has got loads of good stuff. Um, some of the, the, I guess the, um, so, you know, Euros worlds, the classic ones, right? My one piece of advice would be you are generally better off looking at high rooms in in rounds than you are out rounds because out rounds are often a bit weird because you get a bit of a mixture of like teams that are very good um, but nervous or teams that have like somehow fluked their way through the partials and shouldn't really be here. And so and motions are often a bit weirder and strategies a bit weirder. So you're often better off looking at in rounds if you want like a more sensible take on the debate. But uh, look at the motion, prep for 15 minutes, watch the prime minister's speech, then give your own leader of op speech in response to the video. Then afterwards, watch the actual leader of op speech and then compare it to yours. Did they run the same case as you? Did they make the same pieces of rebuttal as you? If they didn't, why didn't they, etc. Were they able to get through more or less material than you? That kind of thing. There are also lots of group drills you can do. One thing I'm going to do um, is I have made this big old list of many different kinds of exercises you can do. There are also lots of great exercises you can find on the internet. Um, what I will do is I will try and share this in the Zoom chat with everyone this big list of drills and exercises. Um, this is not exhaustive. This is not necessarily super high quality. Um, it's in the Zoom chat now, um, but it is a start. And I think it, as much as anything, you can look at this and either steal some of these, use some of these, or just create your own using this as an inspiration. Some of them are like quite specific. They're like, oh, watch this debate video. You can obviously substitute that with a different video if you want, but they're often been picked to identify a particular skill or because they're good examples of something. This is something I do often do with my other students when I, when I teach them. But you can use these things and some of these are extremely repeatable. Some you can do on your own. Lots you can do in groups of almost any size. So if you and your partner want to get together, you can do some drills like this. Um, instead of just doing endless preps or watching debate videos, for example. Uh, how else do you practice your skills? Well, when you are doing a competitive debate, you focus on them. So let's say I want to practice my structure. What I would often do is I would set aside a minute or two of my prep time to force myself to be like, no more arguments. You're just going to think, what is the best way to structure this speech? And then in the debate, I will write a little note to myself on a piece of paper being like structure in big words because that remind, forces me to think that the main purpose of this debate speech is, yes, of course, I'm trying to win the debate as, as we often always are, but I'm not just trying to win the debate. I'm trying to do structure well in this speech. And then after the debate, I'm going to be specifically asking the judge what they thought of my structure. Was it clear? Could I have improved it? And going into each debate with a very specific thing being like, in this debate, I am going to try and do my structure, right? I've got a new idea, a new way of potentially doing structure that I learned off a YouTube video or something, or that I came up with, and I want to see if it works. So I'm going to try out in this debate, and I'm going to ask for feedback. Um, and do this repeatedly. 
of course. Um, if you come up with some new way of structuring your notes, you try it once, you lose the debate and be like, well, that didn't work. That's not a very useful tool, right? You should be doing this multiple times before you can be certain. Well, maybe if I just change this or this, it'll actually be better and it will work for me. Uh, record and listen to your own speeches. Talked about that before. And force yourself to change. Um, I think a lot of people get very set in their ways. They like doing things in certain ways. They like structuring their notes in certain ways. They like prepping in certain ways. And I think I have seen people who are quite good, never really, there's a lot, you know, like a lot of people have broken at Worlds and Euros. There's like, you know, hundreds of them every year, but not all of, a lot of people break, are sort of always sort of in contention for the break, sometimes break, sometimes don't, but they never really get, high on speaker tabs they never really get to lay out rounds consistently or do well at other competitions and the reason is often people get quite good and then become extremely stuck in their habits and don't improve more and one of the reasons for that is that often let's say i'm trying to do a brand new way of note taking for example probably that's going to take me a little while to get useful yes i should try it out in practice debates to begin with but there's no real consequence to me losing the debate but when I try this for real in the tournament, there's a big temptation to be like, I'm just going to go back to the old way that I knew kind of worked, even if I know it's holding me back in some senses, because where I was getting thirds, now I'm getting fourths. The difference here, of course, is that once you get used to it, you will now start getting seconds and firsts in, in similar rooms. So even if there's like an initial drop, because you've changed something radically about the way you approach uh, debating, often in the long term, it will be a big improvement and you've got to stick with it and not be too bothered about very incidental short-term things. Obviously it depends what competition you're doing it, right? You shouldn't try out your brand new ideas at Worlds, for example, that might be a bad time to do it. But certainly in the run-up to the competition, that's what prep comps are there for. They're not just do endless amounts of debating. They are try out new skills, practice your skills, focus. So you've got everything together for the important one. How do we get better at content? Um, debate workshops are very good, mainly because there is clearly a sort of canon, as it were, of debate knowledge, of topics that come up a lot in debates, of ways that we talk about those topics in debates, things that the debating community sort of broadly accepts as being true, where people have intuitions for how proven an argument must be before it's considered proven. Lots of these things are very specific to debating itself and don't really map that well onto reality. Lots of debate topics we would be like, oh, that's horribly unbalanced are actually like quite clearly very balanced in the real world where lots of people have different opinions to us, for example. So because of that, actually watching like debate lectures and there's loads of them on YouTube, the European debate training platform is a really good example of this is a really good place to start because it means that all the things you're learning are going to be debate specific and also within the context of debates. They'll often have motions to discuss where these things are useful. If you don't wanna do that or you're bored of that, and in any case, you should always try and do multiple different sources of information gathering, uh, make sure that the information you're gathering is relatively simple to begin with. Realistically, uh, you could spend hours and hours and hours learning about some extremely particular topic and then you'll get a motion that is sort of kind of about it but also not the exact thing you learned about. So you might end up trying to shoehorn all the things you did learn into the debate and then be irrelevant or you're like wow that was a huge waste of time. So actually what it's much better at is you'll be better off crafting, and this is what all good debaters have, a sort of relatively shallow knowledge of quite a lot of things. I know very little, truthfully, about things like economics, international relations, gender theory, all that kind of stuff that's completely unrelated to what I actually learned at university. Um, I'll answer that in a, question, a second, uh, the question. So, um, what what that means is it is worth having some very general understanding of quite a lot of things and then maybe a couple of good examples that you can then use specifically in debates where you can learn about this general stuff uh for my money the best place to learn a lot of this stuff is just straight up news websites particularly sort of opinion 
pieces or explainers. The BBC does a series of like excellent explainers on various issues. And if you click on almost any sort of current news story about a big event in the BBC, so I don't know, some random story about the American election, for example, there'll be little inline links that are sort of like, what's the deal with postal voting question mark you click on that and you get like you know a thousand words and pretty pictures and some videos explaining to a to a lay person what the important thing is now you might think that look i am sufficiently smart and well read that reading a news article that is pitched at the general public with zero information about something seems beneath me and not that useful it is the opposite. It is the most useful thing because you as a debater have to explain to a judge who might not know anything about it in seven minutes, enough information and enough persuasive argument that you can take them from knowing very little or from knowing uh, nothing at all to believing in your argument. Judges also often have the bad habit of sort of having a kind of set of ideas about emotion that they think, which is probably constructed from their background knowledge of having read the same news story that you've read and sort of a kind of mental checklist of like, mm, but why is this true? They haven't explained it. And then you say like one example, which is the example that the judge coincidentally knows. And the judge is like, aha, they have met my internal threshold for proving things. I will give them credit for this now. So having like shallow knowledge that you can explain easily to take someone with very little background knowledge up to understanding enough for your argument to stick is what you need. So news websites, BBC, Financial Times, The Guardian is a good one for debate because it often sort of has similar opinions to the sort of debating zeitgeist. Wikipedia, underrated, not in the real world, but in debating, Wikipedia is super underrated for things like case filing. You can find anything you want on Wikipedia. Just reading like a couple of the sort of top section of a Wikipedia article about like some random thing, like you're like, oh, I need to learn about Mercus or, well, I'll read hundred words at the top of the Wikipedia article, look at some stats, and there we go. That's all I ever need to know about it. Uh, the Economist, lots of debaters like, it is fine. It is probably too much to be worth reading. Maybe you can get some interesting detailed case studies on it, um, but for the most part, if you're reading The Economist cover to cover, that's just time wasted. Uh, but the biggest waste of time of, of, of all is uh, reading academic papers and books, particularly those that are not really in your field. So if you want to learn about philosophy and debates, what you should do, of course, is come to Hamza's lecture later. What you should not do is try and read Leviathan, uh, because that will just waste a huge amount of your time. Even the sort of sort of accessible books that like other debaters like, like lots of, frankly, in my experience, mediocre debaters will be like, prison of geography is great. So they're either people who are not good at debating or people who like just find that kind of stuff interesting anyway. I'm not one of those people. If you read the whole of Prisoners of Geography, you can maybe extract like a couple of arguments out of that, but it's taken you like many, many hours to read. That was a waste of time. You could have extracted those same arguments from like a two minute BBC news video explaining something about the refugee crisis, for example. Um, the one set of books that is sometimes worth looking at, I'll see if I can grab a link to this, uh, that did help me a bit, particularly with the more rigorous stuff. So econ was not something that I really knew a great deal about and still is not. But um, there are uh, a series of books called A Very Short Introduction To. They are published by the Oxford University Press. And you can basically find a book on almost anything. They're sort of like A5 sized, maybe like 100 pages. You can read one in a couple of hours. And they are designed to sort of introduce people to broad topics. Now, there's actually a huge number of them. But for example, I read the very short introduction to economics. And that made me, at the very least, have enough basic understanding that I could be reasonably confident and then applying more specific knowledge that I found on the news, on the internet. One thing that I struggled a lot with when I was starting out is having in my head a sort of big picture of something. I could read a news story about something that's happened in, let's say, Israel, Palestine, right? But I didn't have a background in international relations or just know that much about the region such that it was hard for me to place in context specific incidents, events, examples. What you are better off doing is building that basic understanding and then that way, and that's where something like this does help or the, the think pieces and explainers do help, then you can 
add in extra things that you will read. And honestly, it's just a good habit to get into for life, but also for debating. Just occasionally read the news and think, huh, how could I use this in a debate? What is a debate where this thing that I'm reading right now could be in some way of use? And you will see that really good debaters often use things that they know about or they care about in debates a lot because they have an understanding of how to deploy them. So um, last things on this, before I answer to Chris's question, uh, ask other debaters. Um, might be people in your round, might be the judges in your round. What would you have run? Let's say you have a motion and you're like, I have no idea what happened in this motion. I don't know anything about this. What could I have said? Go and ask someone. Uh, maybe ask the CA um, or ask another debater at the competition who is good um, or even just a bit better than you. Get some ideas and try and learn that way. Most debaters are quite friendly and love talking and the sound of their own voice. That's why they do this activity. So if you go and ask them, what would you have said in this motion? They'll be like, oh, wow, you've come to me. What a great boost to my ego. I will now lecture you for half an hour. And you can at least get something useful out of that. Last thing you can do, of course, is steal cases. Um, so you listen in and out round to someone very good saying something very good about a particular topic. You go, that is a really nice way of constructing that argument. I will steal that and I will run it again. Obviously, you need to understand it first. Why is it good? How does it work? So then you can make the relevant changes to make it applicable to the particular motion you are doing. Um, don't just like randomly quote verbatim things Sheng Wu has said, because that won't make you good. But if you understand what the argument was, why it was made, and then you can change bits of it to make it applicable to the debate you're having, then by all means, steal things Sheng Wu said. So the question that was asked was when you're considering resources like the European Debate Training Platform, a lot of the content on there is old or overlapping. Is there a good way to know what to prioritize in terms of material? So in terms of the general topics you should be prioritizing, um, I think you can, there are a few ways to do that. One is to think about what stuff do I just not know much about? Debating has a very clear canon. There are some topics you just need to know about. You need to know about gender issues, race, race issues. You need to know about uh, queer issues. In terms of international relations, Israel-Palestine comes up repeatedly, the Middle East. We're increasingly seeing a lot more debates about China, for example. Every now and again, we get a Latin American motion, but honestly, not that often. Uh, US politics comes up all the time. Stuff about the EU is useful to know. Um, basically, vague current events, like big issues happening in the world, keep somewhat abreast of. But the thing that these training platform videos are useful for is giving you a general understanding. The other way you can know is what are you bad at? You do a debate about econ, you're like, wow, we were terrible in that debate. I know nothing about econ. That is the thing you need to do. These videos are old, some of them, and then obviously, hopefully, Zagreb Euros will make loads. I'm sure St. Petersburg Euros, if they win, will also make loads, so that's good. Um, even though they are old, a lot of the kind of general principles are still very applicable, and you can very easily watch a sort of video on, and I think Melda has one on Turkey, for example, and in that case, that's probably a bit more out of date than if you watched a video on how to do uh, sort of uh, queer rights motions, right? Because international relations in particular evolves at a much greater pace than lots of other issues, um, but many things don't. And you can still get the basic foundations and principles and then just look at the Wikipedia page to see if anything relevant has happened in the last few years. Um, so I would say prioritize videos that are made by good people that have put some thought into what they are saying. Um, so, you know, if there are like three videos about Israel, Palestine, and one of them is done by Dan Lahav, probably watch that one, even if it's two years old, uh, is the short answer. Um, does that answer your question? Cool. Okay. General exercises that will help you improve regardless. And this is for like, uh, whatever skill you're trying to improve, or if you're like really struggling to pin down a particular thing, you're just like, I'm bad at all things. I mean, you're probably worse at some things than others, but in that case, whatever. How do we get better? So 
number one thing we can do is proams. And importantly, this is in both directions. Uh, you might say, ah, but I'm really bad. I shouldn't be the pro in any proam. That is not true. Regardless of how good or bad you are at debating, proams in both directions are very useful. So in the direction where you are the am, and this is like, even if you don't fulfill the criteria of am, an am, let's say I've been debating for a few years, I've got some breaks, I like almost broke at euros, but missed it on speaks, but I want to get better, then you just need a pro who is like relative to you, a pro, right? So find someone who is significantly better than you. Uh, approach this with the mindset of, I am learning many things. Um, so all of you who are coming this weekend, you should be asking your pros for feedback on specific things, as well as general things. They might notice things that you have not thought about. When the pro comes up with a case in prep time, ask them why that is the case. Try and understand it. Why can't we say this other thing? If you have an idea for an argument, don't just be quiet and be like, okay, I'll, I guess I'll just say whatever Lucia wants me to say. Uh, no, come up with your own case and then try and understand why the pro's case is different for you, from yours. I think there is a bit of a problem with programs sometimes where people look at this as a ticket to like, look, I'm going with this really great debater. So this is my chance to get a break. Hooray, I've got a break. Right, but now you're going back to debating not with your pro and you didn't actually learn anything. You know, like a lot of the real pros could carry like, you know, a literal child, like an 11 year old to break at some competitions if the pro is good enough. Does that mean the 11 year old has learned anything? Probably not. And so when you get these opportunities, you need to be extremely proactive and conscious of what you're getting out of them. The other direction is the more interesting one that I think people don't realize. If you are starting out or even like okay, but not great, there is still a huge amount that you can learn from a pro -am. In particular, I think what pro -ams teach you to do is to be incredibly responsible and incredibly strategic in what you're saying. The short version of this is you can't really make mistakes. If I know that the person speaking after me is useless, um, then the debate is either going to be won or lost in my speech. If I'm the prime minister, for example, I need to make sure everything in PM is super, super tight. I need to be asking extremely pointed POIs. I can't be wasting them because I can't really rely on my partner to save me if I make mistakes. And this applies for literally any position. So my advice would always be, if you are doing a program in which you are the pro, you should always speak in the position you normally speak in regardless of whether that is going to help you win or lose, you should not be thinking about winning or losing. You should be thinking about, well, how do I take responsibility for this when I know the focus is on me and my speech? Obviously, you're also then helping your arm develop, but in helping them develop, you will probably help yourself, right? If they're like, why is this the case? And you're like, oh, I don't really know. I just think it's the case well, that's probably not very good, is it? You have no idea why you're actually making this argument or what to run. If you can't answer their questions constructively, then um, that signals an issue. So they might reveal information about what you need to train. It might also just force you to practice a lot and be extremely dedicated to certain skills. If you're an extension speaker and you know the whip is useless, well, debate has to be one in extension and vice versa. You're the whip speaker, you know that the extension speaker probably isn't going to say that much. Well, you've got to be absolutely on it with your rebuttal and your framing. And so this will help you a lot. And okay, maybe you're still in like the second bottom room and you're never going to break, but it's still useful skills, right? Taking an extension that's really poor and being able to whip it into something is a skill that you can then practice when you're with your regular partner three or four rooms up the tab. So programs in both directions. Next thing you can do, judging. I think if you want to become a better speaker, obviously it is important to speak a lot. It is also very useful to judge a reasonable amount. I would say like, you know, for every, I don't know, like let's pick an arbitrary number here, three, maybe four competitions you speak at, you should judge at one. And again, you should be judging proactively with a vehicle to improving your own speaking. I think judging helped me a lot, in particular because I was a whip speaker. And if you're a whip speaker, being able to understand like who's doing well or less well in the debate uh, is a fundamental skill of, of whipping. But in any case, whatever position you speak in, judging is really useful. 
The reason why judging is useful is because it makes you understand and think about debating from a different perspective than the one you normally have. So if you speak all the time, you often get into bad habits or you do things that you think are really effective. You lose debates. You don't really know why. Uh, when you judge, you suddenly start listening to people and you get exposed to all these different um, styles and practices and skills. And some of them are really good and some of them are terrible. And you might start to realize, you know, I do that all the time. Uh, this thing that I do, this speaker is doing, and I now as a judge find this really unpersuasive. I think this has not helped at all. I don't know why they're doing it. Why is this person not rebutting the previous speaker? This is such a dumb thing to do. They're so keen to get their extension out. They're not actually spending time on it. I think for me, it was a good thing um, in particular with rebuttal. Um, I'm very old. I don't know if you've seen me debate, but one of the things I, as a speaker, um, is quite, um, I tread a fine line between being quite dismissive and quite effective at rebutting. It's just my natural speaking style is to be like, well, that was stupid, wasn't it? Um, this can be very effective. It can also be extremely ineffective if you just sort of glibly respond to something without actually responding to something. Judges find that very annoying. So for me, finding the sort of line of when you can be like dismissive of an argument, but in an effective way, was something I learned by judging what I would get a much better barometer of when I don't have an investment in it. Because debaters often think they're more right than they are. Almost all debaters are naturally more optimistic about their speaks and their debate ranking than they actually are because they've spent an hour thinking about and convincing themselves that they believe the side that they're saying in the debate. Um, so being a neutral perspective, judging people who you don't really care who wins or loses, allows you to just see what's effective, what's ineffective. Steal the good things, cut out the bad things from your own uh, debating. Um, also gives you lots of good opportunities to talk to um, really good uh, people. If you're winging someone who's very competent, okay, you've got a completely different call to them. Doesn't really matter. As long as you can understand why the call was what it was and you can hear what their thoughts were on the debate, you can also use that with your own speaking. Uh, next thing partner choice. One of the things that helped me a lot was for the first couple of years, I basically had a different partner every week. Um, that's not useful. Okay. Changing partners is useful, but it's also good to have a sort of semi-regular partner or partners who you speak with a decent amount. That way you can eliminate a lot of the noise about, oh, who's going to speak first? Who's going to speak second? Um, how do we prep? You can get comfortable. You can start working on specific skills when you're not worrying about all the other stuff. You will also, just by getting better at teamwork and knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses, over time, speak much better. It's why, for example, if I put two random people together at one tournament, they might not do very well. If they then do a bunch of prep tournaments, they then will do very well. Now, even if they as individual debaters have maybe not improved that much, they as a team have improved. And that's going to put you in more competitive rooms, more challenging debates, and is going to provide you the platform to do well as a speaker. So finding someone, they don't need to be as good as you. They can be worse than you. They can be better than you. But finding someone who is like equivalently keen as you is probably the main thing and will go to tournaments with you, will practice with you, um, I think is really useful. And maybe you will change that over time because you will they will graduate and you'll need to find a new partner and you'll have to relearn it all but having a vaguely regular partner is really useful that you then intersperse with random other people your mates people you don't know proams etc because you'll then learn different things both ends of the scale are very bad if you just have one partner who is the only person you speak with forever you are gonna develop a huge number of bad habits because you just settle into the routine. You're like, well, I never need to rebut because the person who I'm partnered with is much better at rebutting than me and they always over rebut, so there's no point. Um, okay, now you don't know how to rebut an extension and when you're with someone else, that might be a problem. Likewise, you're like, oh, I don't need to learn anything about, I don't know, feminism because my partner knows it all. Bad habits, so do switch it up a bit, even if you keep coming back to that partner for the internationals or the major tournaments, flitting around between a few other people um, is very useful. Tournaments, which tournaments should you attend? Well, 
uh, obviously the short answer is as many as you can. Um, the longer answer is be extremely selective and think about the kind of tournaments you're going to attend. Some tournaments are much better than others. And you want to be looking at two things when you do the tournament. One is the teams, right? Ideally, the strongest possible tournament is best. If you just get repeatedly smashed by Oxford A for four rounds in a row, I mean, not this year's Oxford A, but a real Oxford A, then um, that is a learning experience in of itself. Seeing really good debaters speak in motions that you know about in debates that you're in, even if you lose to them, if you can understand why you lost to them and get um, feedback about it, then uh, you will get a lot better. Second thing you need to care about is the uh, quality of judging. Um, getting good judging is really, really important. Now, I'll say in a second about bad judges because there is useful stuff to be gleaned from them. But obviously, better judges are going to give you better feedback. Think about the judge pool. Think about the team pool. Obviously, you don't always know, like in advance, who the judges are going to be. But you can look at the CA team and be like, oh, it's these people are reasonably responsible. Um, they will probably set reasonable motions and bring decent judges in versus these people are just like, oh, it's the convener's mate who has no experience, but it's the CA. Probably give that one a miss. There's also lots of historic debaters, particular tournaments have particular sort of um, histories. So the classic like Oxford Cambridge IV is going to be very competitive, high quality judging. Obviously this year online, everything's a bit weird, um, but certainly in person tournaments, there are expectations you should have. And you should try and go to a variety of them. Going to a sort of weak regional local tournament um, you know, you go to Nam de Novice or something um, is useful, but up to a point. If you just keep going to local tournaments, you just win all of your local tournaments, but then keep losing when you go to more difficult tournaments, the sort of Nam de curse of when they turn up to Oxford and Cambridge and get battered, but then go and win Liverpool IV with a pair of, with an average of an 85, um, is that you will only get better if you're exposed to more different judges, more different people, more different debating styles, and harder, better debates. So prioritize stronger tournaments if you can with stronger teams and stronger judges. Um, don't just go to easy tournaments because you want to win. You'll never get better. Challenge yourself. That's how you improve. It's better to lose against a good person than to win against a bad person. Uh, you will probably learn more from the loss. Feedback. How do we approach feedback? So first thing is that you should have different, you should approach the judges with direct questions. Um, and that will help them a lot. If you just got to a judge and be like any general feedback, the judge will probably just look through their notes, give you some generic platitude about like, oh, I guess your second argument was kind of okay, but maybe you could have done more impacting or something. Um, that's not very helpful. As a judge, I'm sure you've all done it. Someone comes up to you and says, general feedback, and you're like, well, I just gave you a, an oral adge. I might have something specific to say to you. I also might not. If you come up to them with a very specific question and say, can you give me feedback on my timing? Do you think I spent too long on my rebuttal? Sort of acts as a prompt, obviously, so the judge can think about it, but then they will give you a more meaningful answer. So a specific question about something you're practicing these questions you should be asking your judges after every single round. Doesn't matter who the judge is, whether they are a good judge, a bad judge, you ask them anyway and listen to what they have to say and ideally you write it down. If you aren't practicing anything specific, you should still try and formulate questions. Even just something really simple, like you go to the judge and say, what do you think would be the was the single weakest aspect of my speech? And they will have something, right? And again, if you notice patterns, very useful for you. You should ideally know who your judge is. Maybe you don't know before the debate or during the debate or even after the debate. You get your feedback, you write it down, then you go ask someone senior in society, oh, hey, who is, um, I don't know, who is Emma Lucas? Should I trust what they have to say? And hopefully they will say, yes, you should. And that is useful. 
Equally, you might get a judge who is a total rando who gives you some advice that you're a bit confused by and they're like, oh yeah, that person's an idiot. Don't worry about it. Okay. So you in debating in some ways are bombarded with feedback. So having some kind of barometer or structure of knowing which feedback is reasonable and should prioritize. And so that is feedback that comes from very good, well-respected judges, although I guess well-respected again, respected by whom. Um, and um, trends. Even if the judge is an idiot and you know they're an idiot and everyone says they're an idiot, but they say the same thing that all of the good judges say, well, then you should probably take that seriously. With specific regard to then bad judges and questionable results, right? You're like fairly confident that you won. Somehow you get a fourth. The judges insane reasons are just insane. Um, that is unfortunate and that happens. However, um, the, the mindset I think you need to take here is that there's probably always something you could have done. The way I always think about it is like, there's probably just like a degree of noise in debating from, you know, the inherent subjectivity of the activity, the judge not listening, especially online. They're like, oh, they're, you know, playing RuneScape and not actually paying attention to you, which they shouldn't be doing, but they often are. Um, there is a degree of noise. You can't necessarily shrink the window of noise. And for some judges, it's gonna be bigger than others. What you can do though, is if your speech is like so good that even like a noisy, terrible judge is still gonna give you the win. Maybe the speaks are a bit wild, right? But that's one of the things that the really good debaters do very well, is that they are so consistent and win debates so clearly and cleanly that even slightly crazy judges will give them the win, okay? And that can be annoying sometimes if you're the team that took the second, you're like, oh man, I really thought we beat them this time. And the sort of crazy, not paying attention judge just was like, ah, oh, Cambridge A wins. Um, that is extremely annoying. But one of the reasons why they do win is because they're extremely clear and consistent and try and win debates or put themselves in positions whereby random judging is less likely to affect them. If you have a case that relies on a couple of examples being true, then you're rolling the dice essentially. Does the judge believe these examples? Does the judge accept our framing? That is a risky strategy. And maybe a good judge would be like, yeah, you proved this fine, happy days, you win, pair of 84s. But a bad judge might be like, no, I didn't get it, 75s, have a fourth. So trying to minimize your vulnerability to questionable random judging is something you can do. And this is why you should always listen to the feedback that bad judges give. There is a, there is a sort of, I don't know, it is tempting to, the judge gives a fourth and you're like, what? You listen to their oral ads, you think that still made no sense. It's lunchtime, you say to your teammate, this judge is an idiot. They're like, yeah, they are. And then, you know, you just leave and don't get feedback. No, get feedback. It might be totally a name, but you'll probably at least learn one thing about one thing that you could have done better the next time you will idiot proof your case. Um, and I think that is again, a, a thing you should be thinking about is like, how do I idiot proof all of my arguments and all of my speeches? Not gonna get into this too much because that's a specific skill, but it is worth thinking about doing things like leading with conclusions, extremely simple logic, such that even an idiot will believe that you have won the debate. Okay. So, any questions about any of that, by the way? Because we've only had one question so far. Okay, next bit then. Um, how do you mechanize? Um, well, you mean like, okay, yeah, so that is, um, in a way, a different question for a different day. Um, but the short answer is try and give a really plausible story that does not rely on particular interpretations of facts. Give multiple reasons for everything. Be very self-conscious about what things you're asking judges to just kind of accept at face value, what things you do have reasons for. 
and then just be comparative, right? Maybe the judge like doesn't really believe your mechs. If you can explain why the other team's mechs are like also super subjective or rely on like random interpretations of facts, then maybe a judge is willing to be like, yeah, you know what? I don't really believe what you say, but I guess you tried to prove it more than the other team did. Therefore, you are better. Um, but I think the the sort of how to make arguments when judges are subjective is a sort of fundamental question of debating. The only real answer is to just make better arguments with more neutral logic, leave fewer sort of hanging assertions where the judge just has to believe that your particular interpretation of reality is true for the argument to make sense, and then walk judges through it. Lead with a conclusion. I am going to prove to you why this will, I don't know, uh, lead to uh, a recession in this country. Tell them the conclusion first, walk through four different reasons why this is. Reason number one, this is true because of these two reasons. Reason number two is true for these two reasons. Blah, blah, blah. Lots and lots of different mechs. Um, and make sure each mech is justified. There's probably a sweet spot of like maybe two good reasons why a particular claim is true. Don't fall into the trap of being like, but I gave eight reasons. It's like, yeah, because each of them was like one sentence, um, which I see people do. They're like, eight reasons why this thing is true. And as a judge, you're already like, I bet like four of them will be the same. Two of them will be stupid. One of them will be an actual argument that you haven't explained. And the other team won't even rebut all eight anyway. They'll just sort of frame your argument out. So that's probably the best thing to do. Um, but you're right, it's hard. Um, Okay, so back to improving then, setting goals and measuring progress. So if you want to get better at something, the best thing to do is to give yourself a series of goals. Uh, you should be realistic, obviously. Um, don't be like, my goal is to win worlds. Not a very helpful goal. Short, medium, and long-term goals. I want to do well at this competition in a month's time. I want to be in the contention for the break. I want to be live on day three of Euros. And maybe I do want to break at Euros. Maybe not this year, next year, okay? Second thing with your goals is that they should be ideally measurable. So if you say, I want to get better as a whip speaker, it's kind of hard to know, like, have you got better at that? There are some subjective assessments you can do. You can ask people, maybe judges that have seen you, you are in societies with sort of training systems to sort of people in the training system above you might be like, yeah, you have got loads better. You can listen to your own speeches um, and you can listen to a speech that you gave six months ago and one you gave yesterday. And hopefully you'll be able to hear a difference and be like, wow, I am loads better. And the, one of the reasons why these goals, short term goals are important is because I think there is a trap in debating where people feel like they're not getting better. In some cases, you might not be, but often in lots of cases, it's because there's sort of expectation creep or people, everyone else is also getting better, right? So you're like, you start at university at the same time as someone else in some other universities, you will go to a freshest competition, they beat you. Now, two years later, they beat you in a Euros quarter and you're like, I've not improved, I'm still losing to Darian or whatever. And you're like, well, maybe, but that's because you're losing to the same people. Relatively, you're all about as good as you were to each other two years ago, but in absolute terms, before you were losing to them in the bin room of the LSE Pro-Am, now you're losing to them in a Euros quarter final. So like clearly you've improved a lot. I just think often relative things and relative expectation creep. First, you wanna be missing the break on speaks. Then you wanna be breaking. Then you wanna be getting to the semis. Then you wanna be getting to the finals. Then you wanna be winning. Um, incidentally, managing those expectations I think is also quite important, probably not for you guys right now but the better you get the more sort of dissatisfied you will be when you don't you know you're like well i didn't top 10 i didn't get to the final this was a huge waste of a weekend that's not a good mindset to get in so having sort of constant growth aims and goals that are achievable is very useful so how do we track measurable goals well we can do the sort of very obvious like i want to break at this tournament did you break at the tournament? Yes, congrats, you have measured your goal. You can also do more detailed, specific things. 
So one thing that I used in the past and have made is a speaker tracker. Um, let's make this bigger. I don't know if this makes it easier or harder for you to see. Um, but there are a huge number of data points you can get in debating. And I think what I'll actually do is I'll bring it up so you should now be able to see it. So I will link this. Um, and if you're interested, you can make something like this. But basically, I'll link this exact template. You can make it your own. And maybe I'll just talk through this. So what I'll do is I will send you all a link to this. And you can make a copy and play around with it. You don't have to do something like this. You might have your own. You might just not be bothered. This section of the chat might be very uninteresting to you. But this kind of thing is quite useful. So this is the example one. Um, and essentially, all you do is you put in a tournament. So here, Mexico Worlds, right? Spoke at Mexico Worlds. This was my partner. These were the room points. These were the motion types. These were my position. These are my speaker points. And this is the result. And you know, the way I set this up is, you know, these are all little drop downs. You can click which motion type you want. If you want to change what the motion types are, you put them in here. You put your different partners in here. Blah 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 blah. Okay, and if you get into the habit of doing this after a competition, it's not that difficult. I just put a couple of random things from mine. I do have the one I've not used it for years, but like, if you just do it over time, then actually you will build up just a huge amount of data. There's something. What have we got? Two hundred data points put in here from like. A year or two of debating. And then the benefit of something like this is you can then start looking at some things. So you can look at things like what are motions that I'm good at? So for example, um, I think I changed this on this one, did I not? I added some, yeah, so maybe I'll update, uh, I'll do an updated one for you guys. But here, for example, I can see that my best motion type is identity politics, where I, after 11 rounds, have averaged an 82.55 and an average of 2.73 team points. My worst is IR. In a way, this is not. And I've done 24 IR motions, and that's my worst. I average 1.7. I average worse than a second in IR motions. And this is kind of useful, right? Because it tells me that clearly I need to learn more about IR. Now, I know this. Um, I'm obviously sort of not debating competitively anymore. And so that's not really an issue. I can also see my partners. Now, hilariously, my best partner is myself because I iron manned six times and won every single debate that I iron manned. I don't know what tournaments that was at, but who knows. Um, but more meaningfully, um, my second best partner is <laughs> MDG, hilariously. Um, and then other people, but you can see like the major ones I've done internationals with, I can see, right, that I did best with Al and then with Kate and then with Etz. You can draw graphs. These ones are a bit lame because they're just these thing, graphs by motion type, by partner. You can draw graphs by room points. This is also useful, right? I do pretty well in round one. Um, I do okay in straights and minus one rooms, but you can see that my average points over here, I don't know if you see my mouse when I do this, but um, this graph that I'm looking at here, um, when the room is a two point room, I don't do super well. Um, I do much better in zero and one point rooms. So you can see. Similarly, you can do speaks, right? So my average speaks in round one are 80.97 apparently. Um, I can also do it by position. So this is interesting. I can see that my worst speaker position is uh, government whip. Then it is DPM. My best speaker position is um, of the ones I do regularly is op whip and then deputy leader of op. I can do combinations, right? My um, in general, when I give extensions, I'm averaging an 82. When I whip, 81.75. Um, obviously here, I included the rounds because I very rarely do extension speeches. There's only five extension speeches in the data, but there are 100 whip speeches. You can do useful things like exclude a tournament. So let's say I did one tournament that I was really terrible at. I'm just like, you know what? 
uh, KCLIV with Alistair Donovan, we're not gonna count that. And then the numbers will change. Um, I can also do specific time periods, right? Let's say I wanna look at, I only want to think about, I care about my data between, let's say, I don't know, the January um, the 1st, 2016, and January the 1st, 2017. So in that one year, right? In that one year, oh look, I only spoke with four people in that year. I spoke with MDG once, I spoke with Rebecca once, and I spoke a bunch of rounds with Kate and Etz. Um, and I can see, you know, now all these graphs are redrawn for that one year. Potentially more usefully as well is changes over time. So these graphs have now redrawn based on the time periods I put in. Indeed, it seems like I managed to get slightly worse this year. Obviously, there's a lot of noise. You can see I did a tournament here. I did a few tournaments here. This is clearly around Euros. I did some tournaments around Worlds and did basically nothing in the gaps between them. Um, but if I went back to, let's say I just delete these and show me all the data because then the graphs will be more useful. Um, here are some bigger graphs. I can see that my average speaks over time have somewhat gone up. Now, in a way, I only started doing this, as I said, around Warsaw time. Um, and I put a bit of older data in, but it would be more use, I guess for you guys, it'd be more useful to see if I did this all the way back to say 2012. Um, I'll answer that in one second and then, you know, generic things, right? So let's say I just want to see, I don't know, how do I do in GovWhip over time? I've got better. How about my partner? Have I got better with ETS? No, I got worse with ETS, which broadly tallies with my experience. That was not a super great team. What about Lucia? I've only spoken with Lucia once in this data set. Um, what about Kate? There we go. Did a bunch of competitions before Dutch Worlds. Did a bunch of competition, did one competition before Talent Euros. And we did pretty well. So you can see the graph helpfully goes up in a nice line. Maybe I care about motion types. Um, the question then was asked, is it worth comparing competitions from different circuits this way? I guess the answer is, yeah, you could do. Um, this doesn't do that. I guess I could think about, you can just add it. Your, I, what I'm gonna do, I think, is just, um, share a version of this. Um, hang on, let's just say share. This is probably a huge GDPR violation, now I think about it, but whatever. Um, please don't sue me, EU. Um, I will share a deleted version of, what I'll do is I'll delete, I'll anonymize the names and the tournaments and then I will share the more up-to-date version of this with you guys. And I'll share it in the Discord, actually. It's probably the easiest thing to do. So after this. Um, the question of different circuits, I think, is interesting. Um, circuits, I think, is potentially useful. Um, in, re in reality, though, online debating has blurred a lot of circuits. So... Um, what it means to be doing a sort of European circuit competition. A lot of the judges are not going to be European. A lot of the teams are not European. So there's a bit of a blend. Um, when we go back to in-person stuff, those distinctions are more meaningful. And you're right that there are huge trends. In my own experience, like there are huge differences. I lived in um, Shanghai and Hong Kong for two years. And the differences in sort of expectations and judging and Asian debating is very, very different to European debating. So I think it would be worth doing. I think online debating is a bit of a weird thing that will hopefully disappear soon and won't be super relevant. Um, you probably won't get enough data points either and it'll be very hard to classify. You could just do a online versus in-person. Um, you can add all these things. The spreadsheet is 
I think relatively intuitive to use. If you know anything about Excel, it shouldn't be too hard to edit. It all works on formulae because I'm lazy and didn't want to write any macros. So you should be able to edit it reasonably easily. So you can add that stuff in for, for yourself. Okay, back to this. So set goals, measure your progress, see things over time, see trends, look at the data. It seems tedious, but it's very easy to do. You know, you do a competition, it'll take you all of two minutes to put the data in for that competition. Uh, you can also put in feedback and look at feedback trends if you want. So um, general approach, mindset to all of this. First is, um, and we're getting to the end now, so don't worry. Uh, you should be positive. Debating should be fun. Debating is a game. It's really not that important in the grand scheme of things, no matter how many times people try and tell you that it is. Um, you should be enjoying yourself. And if you're not enjoying yourself and you feel like you're not enjoying yourself because you're putting way too much pressure on yourself, um, then that's not good. Where there are actually like genuinely useful things that come out of debating, often breaking at Euros is not wanting one of them. It is meeting different kinds of people, having conversations, broadening your horizons, finding a space in which you can express your ideas and your identity without other people judging you too much. But winning the debate is not the important thing in that respect. Winning the debate is purely sort of an extra bonus. So if you feel like all of this stuff is making you not enjoy debating, then you should probably slow down, revise your expectations, take the foot off the gas for a bit, it's up to you to decide. Do you want to win? Uh, if you do, do this. If you want to have fun and this is getting in the way of that, stop doing it. Don't be defeatist. Uh, judging is super subjective and super random. Lots of different things can go wrong. Maybe you've been working really hard on your structure and then the judge is like, oh, your structure was awful and you feel like it wasn't. Maybe the judge is wrong. Maybe just in this particular debate, your structure wasn't good. But there are so many different factors that can go into winning or losing a debate that focusing on like one really uniquely is probably not um, that good, particularly in individual instances and even individual tournaments. Sometimes you just have like a really terrible tournament for various reasons, maybe debating, maybe non-debating, maybe you're just really tired, maybe you felt kind of ill, uh, maybe the motions and the judges just routinely, you lost a bunch of marginal calls and the motions were not things you liked. It happens to all of us, don't worry about it. Um, everything takes time. Don't expect to start doing this and immediately get loads better. Um, if you look at the little graph I showed, which I put here again to illustrate the point that progress is not linear, three internationals, I was about the same or slowly getting worse. Then I got better. Indeed, even the last one, Mexico, I did slightly worse than Talon. Although again, at the very, very tops of tabs, things get iffy and conclusions aren't super meaningful there. Um, but the main point here is that progress is not linear and it takes time. Um, it can take a year or more before you get meaningful results, but they can very well be meaningful. Warsaw, I was like somewhere, ter somewhere like 60, 80, somewhere in like that, maybe 90, somewhere in that order of magnitude of the tab versus being top 10 at Talon in Mexico. So, you can go from being quite a way off where you want to be to being where you want to be and to doing quite well with not huge amounts of time, but it's not going to be click your fingers and you're there. You've got to stick at it. Common problems with this whole thing. Inconsistency, have a process for all things, have ways you do prep, ways you structure your stuff, try and make sure that you are consistent and that you are taking your seconds. You can be a world's finalist. Indeed, you only need to win one debate to win worlds. If you take a second every single round, you will break, you will go through all the out rounds, win the final, home and dry. You only need to win one debate to win a tournament. And what good debaters do is they don't take losses to worse teams. Now I'm sure we've all been there. We come into a room, we see the other teams and we think easy, right? You know, I should definitely be beating all these teams. And then somehow you drop a point or two and you get really angry and you think, oh, this is awful. The judge is really bad. Probably it's what we said about noise, right? You know that you are a better debater than them. You are a better team than them. You should beat them. 
but the noise that you introduced by running a slightly wacky case, by trying to do something too clever, uh, ended up with you losing the debate. And actually, avoiding trying too hard and just focusing on those basics, doing the basics incredibly, incredibly well. Most of the teams that do really, really well at internationals, there are some people who are just like extremely sort of idiosyncratic, flair, they do things in weird ways. Sheesh is a good example of this. If you take Owen and Bethany, Arthur and Abhinav, for example, um, Emma and David at this Euros, uh, Hamza and Kira are all good examples of people who don't have these like really weird esoteric debate styles where they do things wildly different from everyone else. All they do is the basics incredibly well incredibly consistently every single round and that is a much more achievable aim than trying to like be a Shen Wu or, or a Darian or someone who does something a bit different and a bit weird because it might you might not be able to tap into that particular style of debating but everyone can tap into the style of debating which is do the basics extremely well extremely consistently every single round and that is what's going to take you from you know middle of the tab to to the top of the tab in in most cases defeatism don't be like oh we're definitely going to lose because of this emotion oh we're definitely going to lose because of this uh team in the room if you think the other teams in the room are really good and you're definitely going to fourth well okay be realistic aim for a third uh take the team that you think is weakest or even if you are certain that you're going to fourth you've got to pull up to the top room and it's, you know, Sheesh, Harish, and MDG on the other three teams. And you're like, well, okay, probably going to fourth this one. Or it's a motion you know nothing about on your OG and it's super spec heavy. Doesn't matter. Learn something from the debate. Every single debate is something you can learn and is something you can take away from it meaningfully. And as long as you approach debates with that mindset, you'll at least get something out of it rather than feeling like you've just wasted an hour of your life. So. The main takeaways from all of this then are that in order to get better, you must be proactive. You must think about getting better and take seriously the concept of getting better. You must try to be introspective, think about where you could improve, focus on those things, do drills um, where you can, and try, if you can, collect data set achievable targets and then measure your success against those targets and that will help you a lot okay so um that brings us more or less to the end of the stuff i had planned so um i guess now it's sort of free for all questions that are unrelated to the things i talked about so yeah i'll just check see if there's anything on the um previously submitted questions Okay, so um, no more questions? I guess at this point, um, feel free to unmute and ask them verbally if you have them, if it's taking you a while to talk. Could you link the document with practices? I believe that I just sent it to everyone on Zoom. I will um, get it again. Um, Yeah, hello. Sorry, I didn't mean the, uh, I think you sent the tracker, not the, the documented practices. Okay, then I definitely missed it. My bad. Yeah, um, what I'll do is I'll post all of this stuff in the tournament Discord. Um, sometimes Zoom doesn't like people downloading things or it gets weird. So I'll post um, the tracker. I'll post the I realized that the example I sent you was before I added some more stuff to it. Maybe I will look at how feasible it is to add a sort of like online versus offline or, or circuit type thing um, to it. But I will post an updated version of that for you and I'll have the this PowerPoint as well as the uh, drills and exercises. Um, and I'll put all of that on, on the Discord for everyone. So I had a question about opening, um, mm -hmm. particularly like 
So this is based on experience I just had, right? Which is that we were opening opposition in an out round and all we needed was a second. Mm-hmm. Opening government, um, they had like an actual situation. They messed up the motion. They didn't know their side. So we knew for a fact they were taking the fourth. Uh, and the, the closing two teams were literally like the top of the tap teams. Now, the problem here is, you know, as much as we need to knock at least one of them out, uh, the problem is we can't directly engage with them as an opening team. And I think that this mm-hmm. comes up as a problem in like every time you're opening, which is you just, you absolutely can't engage with closing. So, you know, beyond just like burning the turf and stuff like, you know, taking the most important arguments, how do you show any level of engagement? Okay. So it's a few different things. The, the first thing is like, yes, you are at a disadvantage in in that sense, opening to closing, right? You cannot directly engage with them you however do have the reciprocal advantage of uh you get to speak first and i think what it means is that you need to be sort of preemptively where you can engaging by doing things like i would always if i'm if i'm opening up i'm always taking my pois from um from cg always i i'm very uninterested in taking pois from oh uh, uh, sorry from og and vice versa i'm giving them pois um, I'm also doing framing as much as possible to explain why my material is like the most important relevant stuff in the debate. Um, and you are right that it can be hard, but often OO is OO is like statistically is the strongest position in, in, in debating uh, because most motions are bad ideas, which is why they're not true in the real world. Um, so you need to basically i think leverage the other advantages except that engagement is going to be difficult so where you can pois accept them give them listen to other pois so for example if closing give poi your closing give pois to opening gov is there some information you can glean out of that do you see them being like if they're annoying and they're australian being like here here when opening gov says something so you're like ah oh, okay closing gov's case is in some way you know, related to this thing. Try and deduce as much as you can, basically. And then just do your own thing well, except that you are never going to be able to directly respond to CG as much as you would like. So you just give the sensible op case with as much gusto as possible, and then hope it's enough. That's one of the sort of artifacts of BP debating is that again, you know, if you're opening gov trying to deal with closing opposition, well, there's very little you can do. What you can do is just deliver so much material so well that it sticks to the end of the debate. I think most judges do recognize this and have like a mild preference for like argument was unengaged. It seemed vaguely vaguely plausible. That means that this team is doing very well in the debate. And, you know, obviously closing gov might also have arguments that are unresponded to, but judges will say, well, closing gov, you should have responded to the unresponded arguments from opening up. The fact that your arguments weren't responded to, well, you're closing. So, you know, not that many people are going to do it. We'll penalize closing up for it, but no one else. Um, so I think, yeah, I like turf burning, I think is effective only if you know what you're doing. Honestly, I think a lot of what turf burning really looks like when people are weaker is like just giving an irrelevant argument for two minutes that the closing will either not be extending on anyway or you probably haven't done enough and they'll have a slightly different frame like bp debating is really all just a game of who can frame who out of the debate um, most of the time um certainly at the 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 higher levels so um turf burning can be useful but i would say you're probably better off spending that extra two minutes making sure your case sticks than trying to preemptively prevent your closing from saying something you can also the other thing i would say about this is you can also predict like if you think opening gov has just like completely missed the point of the debate and has not really said anything well then you can have a pretty good idea of what cg is going to say which is the sensible gov arguments so you can position your case against those things quite effectively it's harder when they have like a completely wild take on the debate that is different from everyone else and you're like yeah i don't know how we could have predicted this, but pitching your case to deal with the best and most sensible case from Gov is probably the correct thing to do most of the time. Cool. 
Any more questions? Any suggestions on how to do analysis motions? Um, yeah, the like weird fluffy debates. I guess you just gotta try and come up with some way of explaining, like these debates. So you're like, ah, this house prefers a world where no one can fear or something. Personally, those, those debates are, I think are sometimes fun to be in, but I'm not a huge fan of them. The reason being that basically it, it ends up being a debate about the definition of a word. So what you've got to do is give like a really clear, sensible definition or clear, sensible, you're basically making, most of the time you make one argument and you're like, look, I'm going to give a really simple walkthrough of why this would lead to this specific harm, right? Because those kind of motions, if you think about them, you, you change something fundamental about reality and the human experience, there are gonna be hundreds, thousands of millions of different impacts probably. If humans can't feel fear, that changes so many things that there will always be arguments that every team can make in a good or bad way. What then it is most sensible to do is to try and pick one impact, right? or one specific scenario where you think this either applies to a lot of people or applies to like a particular group in a way that you can explain like this is really, really important. So like memory changing machines. Um, you can be like, look, this is gonna be really, really good for people with PTSD because they can remove their trauma or something, right? And you just make that one argument and you give many reasons why it's true, many reasons why it's really impactful and important and do your weighing as to why we should in particular care about these people for example and that's all you do you pick one like plausible simple interpretation of the motion where no one can be like no this definitely won't happen you give enough reason to believe okay fine this clearly i can see how this works and then you're just like intuition pumping and impacting constantly on your like one thing because in these debates it's often very hard for judges to grasp on like what actually is going to happen so if you can be the team that shows to the judge here is one thing that will happen we don't care about the others but we know for certain this one thing will happen this one thing is really really bad and important so don't do it the judges want to grab on to something that sticks in the debate in these kind of weird fluffy debates so just having like a really simple here is a frame it leads to one consequence that consequence is really bad and that's your case um, will often be very effective in these kind of motions. Cool. All right. Um, any more questions? Nope. Okay. In which case, thank you very much. I hope that was useful for you guys. As I said, I'll post everything uh, for you guys to view. Uh, and we have a break now. And then the next set of workshops is uh, Hamza uh, talking about philosophy and debating, who was the top best speaker at Astana. And then Alex, who's tabbed worlds and euros and many other things, doing a session on uh, introduction to tabbing. So thank you very much, guys. Hope it was really useful. And we'll uh, see you hopefully in the uh, sessions later this afternoon.